Achieving laminar flow over an aircraft is the holy grail that we have been chasing at least for the last 90 years. Indeed, laminar flow control is a technology that offers the potential for improvement in aircraft fuel usage, range or endurance that far exceed any known single aeronautical technology. For transport type airplanes, the fuel burn can be decreased by a phenomenal 30%. Whenever we have been successful in achieving it even partially on an aircraft, it has paid big dividends. The challenges to maintain the laminar flow are huge but not insurmountable. Using modern materials technology, the dream is getting closer. But what are the uphill battles that remain is what we will cover in this video. This fascinating story starts all the way back from the development of the B-54 Liberator and the iconic P-51 Mustang. It carried on with NASA's experimental aircraft, the X-21. The F-16XL, a remarkable fighter jet that unfortunately never made it to mass production, was used successfully as a test bed for this technology. More recently, it has been applied on the Airbus A340. Laminar flow is the reason behind the superior performance of the Honda Jet HA420 and the phenomenal 59% drag reduction of the Celera 500L, giving it unmatchable performance numbers. Laminar flow control is also the only aeronautical technology that offers the capability of designing a transport airplane that can fly non-stop without refueling from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world or that can remain aloft without refueling for approximately 24 hours. To understand this technology, we will first have to understand drag and then laminar flow. Most of us are aware that the force that opposes forward motion in an aircraft is called drag. This drag force can be split into two parts, induced drag and parasitic drag. The induced drag is a byproduct of the lift produced by the aircraft. But the bigger component of the total drag in an aerodynamically smooth body such as an aircraft is not the induced drag, it is rather the parasitic drag. This is mainly caused by the screen friction due to the viscosity of air passing over the aircraft body. In other words, it is the stickiness of air which applies a shear force on the aircraft surface and as a result causes drag. Interestingly, the parasitic drag depends upon the boundary layer, which is a portion of the air in the proximity of the aircraft surface where the frictional effects due to the interaction of the surface and fluid are present. The nature of this boundary layer can have a profound effect on the total drag. If the boundary layer remains laminar, or in other words, the particles passing over the aircraft surface remain orderly and in layers, then the parasitic drag is less. On the other hand, if this layer of air becomes turbulent, then the skin friction and in turn the drag goes up substantially. Throughout the history of aviation, there have been attempts to achieve laminar flow over at least the wings of the aircraft. An ideal wing would have laminar flow over all of its cord length. However, even if it is achieved till 35% of the cord length from the leading edge, and thereafter transitions to turbulence, then such an aircraft is termed as a boundary layer aircraft. We've had quite a few success stories. The B-54 Liberator achieved laminar flow over its wings, which remarkably improved the aircraft performance. Although laminar flow was achieved on its wings, but this was never the designer's intention. Nonetheless, the performance improvement was noted by the engineers. It was in the P-51 Mustang, designed almost a decade later, that the first attempt was made to achieve laminar flow to enhance the aircraft's range. Through laminar flow on just the outer portion of the wing, notable gains in performance were made, and the aircraft stood out. It should be understood that maintaining laminar flow is extremely hard. Laminar flow for most practical applications is difficult to attain, it's inherently unstable, and easy to upset. Any slight surface imperfection or roughness can tip the flow to transition to turbulence. And therefore, even buck splat, raindrop, ice crystal formation, dew, dust or debris deposited on the wing surface is detrimental. It is for this reason that aircraft companies have ventured away from this proposition. Furthermore, the tight tolerances required for the surface smoothness 
and the non-traditional joining methods that did not involve the use of rivets have also been impediments. Other than smoothness, the shape of the body also helps in maintaining laminar flow. This technique of attaining laminar flow through smoothness and favorable pressure gradient shape that will be explained later is called NLF or natural laminar flow. Despite the mentioned challenges, the phenomenon has kept the engineers interested because of high rewards. And this led to more active methods to keep the boundary layer laminar. One method involves the suction of air through tiny holes on the surface of the wings. Doing this allowed the slowest portion of the boundary layer, which is very prone to tripping to turbulence, to be slurped away, thereby stabilizing the boundary layer over a longer surface and for a greater range of speed. It was found that applying cooling on a surface also stabilizes the boundary layer and makes it more resilient. These methods of actively keeping the flow laminar through suction and cooling is called LFC or laminar flow control technique. If both the NLF and LFC are used in conjunction, then this technique is termed as the HLFC or hybrid laminar flow control. For example, natural boundary layer development technique can be used at the leading edge through smoothness and rising curvature, and suction can be used at the trailing edge to delay the transition. The NASA X-21 experimental aircraft was able to successfully demonstrate laminar boundary layer formation and subsequent reduction in fuel consumption through LFC. At the time, the cost of producing the cover sheet with tiny perforation was too high. It was also difficult to maintain the holes getting blocked. This led to the program getting cancelled. Nonetheless, pioneering data was obtained and it was the first time when a laminar boundary layer was achieved on swept wings. Why this was monumental needs to be discussed. You see that as the speed of the aircraft increases, the flow gets more prone to turbulence over the aircraft surface. It is easier to achieve laminar flow for low subsonic speeds, but most of the passenger airliners and commercial jets fly at about 0.8 Mach or just under the speed of sound. Swept wings are important for aircraft flying at this speed because they slow down the relative speed of air passing over the wing, thereby ensuring the speed of air passing over the wing doesn't reach sonic speed and does not create shock waves. However, the cross flow over the wings occurs as a result and this cross flow cuts across the laminar boundary layer making it turbulent. The greater the sweep angle, the harder it is to achieve a laminar boundary layer over the wing. The NASA X-21 was able to achieve laminar boundary layer despite having swept wings, which made the program significant for future developments. It is also interesting to note that the F-16XL a derivative of the F-16 Fighting Falcon was developed as a technology demonstrator and enhanced tactical fighter. It unfortunately lost out to the F-15 Strike Eagle because it didn't have the twin engines that the US Air Force wanted at the time. The aircraft itself though was a marvel of engineering and much superior to its original counterpart. Fortunately, before being consigned to history, NASA took over it and used it for testing. The F-16 XL was fitted with an active suction titanium glove encasing the left wing. The glove had laser cut holes that were nominally 0.065 millimeters in diameter. Through this, NASA were able to achieve laminar flow even at supersonic speed, thereby not only enhancing the aircraft range, but also lowering the sonic boom noise signature. Interestingly, NASA did this for a future high-speed civil transport program. The Honda Jet is a fine example of how laminar flow can benefit the commercial airline industry. The Honda HA420 uses natural laminar flow and not active controls, and yet it has a much superior fuel efficiency compared to other jets in its category. The Airbus are also looking into natural laminar flow on the outer portion of their airliner wings. They have ascertained that even with laminar flow on the outboard segment of the wing, they can reduce the overall drag by 8% and the fuel consumption by 5%. 
And this brings us to the Celera 500L, an aircraft that has been built from scratch to maximize the benefit of laminar flow. The beauty of this aircraft is that it doesn't just focus on achieving laminar flow over the wings, but over the whole aircraft body, including the fuselage and the empennage. And this is exactly the reason why the aircraft looks unlike any other aircraft across the aviation industry and is also the reason behind the 59% lower drag compared to other aircraft in its category. A research done by NASA in 1986 revealed that for an Airbus A300, the fuselage drag made up for 48.7% of the total drag, while the wings contributed to 31.8%. And therefore, if the true benefits of laminar flow are to be realized, then the fuselage drag cannot be neglected. There have been several studies in this regard to find out the optimal fuselage shape that will allow natural laminar flow. Bodies of revolution, for example, revolved airfoil shapes have been studied in great detail. It was found that certain airfoils in which the maximum thickness occurs at a point later on the cord length help to maintain laminar flow. An example of this is the NACA 671015. Why this is the case is because that on the rising portion of the airfoil, there is a favorable pressure gradient in the direction of the flow. Remember the air accelerates over the rising portion of the airfoil? And this acceleration of air keeps the airflow laminar for longer. If you look at the shape of the Celera 500L, it exactly resembles the NACA 671015. Auto Aviation have made a functional prototype of the Celera 500L the size of a business jet. But according to them, this design cannot be scaled up. This is because the Reynolds number increases with the length. The Reynolds number is the measure of the propensity of the flow to go turbulent. Note that the Celera 500L focuses on the NLF technique alone. On the other hand, NASA's concept, the double bubble D8, is a much larger aircraft that will be able to carry 180 passengers while still maintaining laminar flow. In this aircraft, the natural laminar flow is assisted by engines which ingest the boundary layer just as it slows down and thereby increases the length at which the flow transitions to turbulence. It's exciting to see the recent surge of development in this area. With modern materials and techniques, both natural laminar flow and laminar flow control are easier to apply. For example, the recently developed femtosecond laser allows for the creation of very small holes on metal sheets that are needed for boundary layer suction without compromising on productivity. Laminar flow drones have already been developed. The shape of aircraft to come will certainly be different and the Celera 500L is just a glimpse of it. And with this, the video is concluded. If you learned something from it, then please do give it a thumbs up. Thank you for your attention.